That's really helpful, CJ. So those are the questions related to chronic lung disease. Your audio is just breaking up a wee bit. Okay, that, that might be to do with where my speakers are. Is that any better now? That's perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect. Good. So um, as a, a sort of a, a, a last uh, topic in terms of conditions, we'll talk a little bit about intraventricular hemorrhage, and then we'll try and bring all these three topics together into this issue around uh, prognosis and uncertainty with prognosis. Um, and I'm, I'm sure everyone on this uh, on this chat um, are aware of what intraventricular hemorrhages are, what the what the causes of it is, uh, and how we how we define uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, I think again, my experience is that it is easy to define when you look at pictures or when you try and put it into words. It's sometimes a little bit more difficult to define when you're looking at a cranial ultrasound scan and trying to see whether something is 50% or less than 50% uh, and whether the brightness that you're seeing in the ventricle is a hemorrhage or isn't a hemorrhage. Uh, but what is clear is that it is quite a significant problem. Uh, you know, grade one IVHs are seen in about 48% of babies uh, who have were born early. That comes down to about 20% for grade two uh, around sort of 15% for grade three, and again about 20% for what tends to be called grade four. But I'm I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the term grade four, uh, and I've, I've put this picture up uh, deliberately to talk about this word of extension of hemorrhage into the surrounding parenchyma. I, I think increasingly um, that that that's a belief that a lot of people have, but I think increasingly there's a recognition that. Uh, this terminology is probably better, but it's not an extension. It's a parenchymal involvement or periventricular hemorrhagic infarction. The blood isn't leaking out of the ventricle into the parenchyma. It's a different mechanism of injury caused by venous congestion, et cetera, that causes infarction of the, of the parenchyma. Um, it's, a, it's a significant problem because there are significant complications associated with it. Um, and, and what we've so shown is that actually, although improvements in neonatal care have been quite significant, it's still quite a significant number of babies, although probably slightly less than it was in the previous cohort, who develop uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. And, and still about one in fifth of those babies that have significant intraventricular hemorrhage end up needing uh, a surgical interventions such as a, such as a shunt. Uh, so it's still a very, fairly significant condition. Um, there are a number of different thoughts about how uh, you get uh, the, the IVH. Um, the, the first and probably foremost is a disturbance in cerebral blood flow. Uh, and that can be caused by a number of different factors such as hypoxia, hypercarbia, um, severe acidosis, uh, asynchrony between the baby and the ventilator, severity of respiratory distress. Also, I think that severity of respiratory distress probably causes fluctuations in cerebral blood flow through ventilation and hypoxia related issues rather than anything else significant PDA and, and, and ductal steel of blood. Um, interventions such as suctioning of airway that might have an effect in terms of blood pressure, et cetera. And then also rapid changes in pH, which we know has an impact on cerebral um, vasodilatation and vasoconstriction. I think this is probably something that, that we see less now. Um, certainly there's been a, a, a move away from the use of bicarbonate in, in neonatal care. Uh, mostly due to uh, a number of studies showing that it, it really does not change outcome in any any significant way. Other reasons for uh, disturbance in cerebral blood flow, things like high uh, high venous pressure caused by things like pneumothorax, mean, high mean airway pressures, potentially difficulties in delivery, although that's a little bit more contentious, uh, rapid fluctuations in blood pressure. Again, I think my experience is that hypotension on its own or hypertension on its own doesn't tend to cause IVH, but a rapid fluctuation in your blood pressure, uh, either by uh, a child becoming sick very rapidly and their blood pressure dropping very rapidly, or often, I think, uh, intervention. So a child who has significant hypotension for whom we then rapidly infuse IV fluids or use inotropes very um, uh, rapidly which then can cause uh, significant rapid rises in blood pressure. And that up and down movement of blood pressure is often more of a problem. Uh, and then some of the things that we can't control, such as uh, the physiological instability that comes with, from being a very small baby. Um, the, the fragility of the germinal matrix, uh, that's possibly due to immaturity, but also things like sepsis and, and hypoxic insults can make it worse. Uh, 
And then, of course, some of the some of the problems that we see with thrombocytopenia and DIC associated with sepsis, uh, prematurity, growth restriction, uh, infections such as CMV. So all of these things can cause uh, cause IVHs. If you sort of look at uh, all the various uh, reported studies, I think there are sort of um, a number of things that have been shown to increase the risk, decrease the risk, or have no impact on IVH. So increasing the risk of IVH, uh, the need for retinal transfusions, rapid volume expansion, using uh, intraventricular thrombolytics, which I think is quite unusual these days. Uh, but I think this one is, is sometimes under-recognized, but the, uh, uh, the presence of an ascending genital, genital tract infection or, or evidence of significant chorionitis, these children often tend to get uh, more significant intraventricular hemorrhage and more rapid progression of their IVH following birth and children where that isn't present. There are some things that, that don't seem to affect the presence of IVH, uh, inhaled nitric oxide, anticonvulsants, prophylactic surfactant use, early use of corticosteroids. None of these seem to particularly improve IVH. And then there are some things that do tend to reduce the risk of IVH, uh, antenatal steroid use, and potentially the prophylactic treatment of PDAs, although this is also a little bit contentious. Um, so I think IVH um, is one of those things that, that, that I think we can improve uh, the uh, incidence of through good early neonatal care and certainly improvements in respiratory care over the last few years. Um, from my own experience, I think we're seeing far less significant IVH. We do seem to see quite a significant amount still of uh, grade one and grade two IVH. And, and, and those who work with me at St. George's uh, often, you know, it's a bit of a joke that uh, that every child on at St. George's, uh, regardless of gestation, seems to have grade two IVH. Uh, and, and, and there is sometimes, I think, a little bit of an over-reporting of grade two IVH uh, using that um, definition of there being irregularity of the choroid. And my own personal theory on this, which is, which is very much just a personal theory, and I don't think based on any fact, uh, is that our ultrasound machines have become better and better and better. And, and things that we thought were smooth structures in the past are probably not naturally particularly smooth structures. And so we, we see this irregularity in a lot of different things. But in terms of short-term outcomes of IVH, I think we've, we've typically always felt, um, and I think it is still the case that lesser grades of IVH, grade one and grade two, are typically benign in the short term. And, and, and a number of studies have borne this out. But at the higher grades of IVH, grades three, grade four, or, or your periventricular hemorrhagic infarcts, do tend to be associated with more significant short-term problems and medium-term problems uh, with uh, a greater mortality. Um, so 30% of babies are born at around 22 weeks. Uh, if you have sort of significant IVH, uh, you have um, a, a greater than 10, uh, about a tenfold rise in significant IVH. Uh, and of those about 15% end up needing shunts and quite a significant proportion end up dying as well, uh, especially so with the grade four IVH. What's more difficult to, to tease out from some of those studies is where you have grade four IVHs, um, are those babies dying because they're, they, they're physiologically too unstable and unwell to survive? Or are there active decisions being made to, to limit intensive care because of the expected poor outcome? And I think that's a little bit more difficult to tease out. But again, in terms of short-term outcomes, uh, I think what it's shown is that um, Babies who have more significant grades of IVH, uh, whose gestations are less, uh, tend to have poorer outcomes than others. Um, and um, most studies that have looked at outcomes till the age of about two from a longer term outcome perspective suggest that uh, if you have grade one or grade two uh, IVHs, you have no long term sequelae. And I put long term in inverted commas there because I think in the lifetime of a child, two is probably not something that you would consider long-term, although in many neonatal studies, we consider this as a long-term outcome. Uh, and I'll come on to some longer-term outcome studies in just a minute. But uh, by the age of two, if you've had the grade three or above lesion, it tends to be associated with higher rates of uh, cerebral palsy, cognitive impairment, et cetera. Now, I've, I've deliberately uh, not uh, open that Pandora's box of starting to talk about cystic PVL um, and uh, periventricular uh, white matter changes. Uh, again, because uh, those tend to have poorer outcomes 
but also um, it's difficult to tease out um, what where periventricular hemorrhagic infarction uh, ends and you have a different condition that causes your cystic PVL. There's probably an understanding that these are probably a spectrum within the same and your intraventricular hemorrhage is grade one to three are probably a slightly different mechanism of injury. So I think there's a, there's a really good paper that came out uh, earlier this year uh, from uh, Australia where they looked at uh, a very large cohort of children born between sort of 1991 and 2005 um, and looked at uh, around 550 survivors who were born under 28 weeks gestation and, and matched them to children who had no IVH and also term bo uh, born controls who would have been born uh, at the same time as the expected dates of delivery for the babies that were born prematurely. Um, and I think this, this table, which is quite busy, and I'll, I'll, I'll encourage you to go and read this paper because I think it's a, it's a very well-written paper. It looked at uh, some of the, the longer term uh, functional and motor um, uh, abilities of these children who were born um, prematurely and who had IVH. And uh, what it shows is you've got a group here without IVH, a group with grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four IVH. And what it shows is that, you know, with the exception of grade four IVH, um, certainly grade one and grade two IVH from an I in, in, intellectual ability perspective, there isn't a significant difference between grade one, grade two, and not having IVH. And, and this is what we've all uh, felt for some time. If you also look at executive function, which is more assessed by parents, similarly, uh, there isn't a significant difference between grade two, grade one IVH and uh, no IVH. But what's also quite interesting is that if you look at grade three and grade four IVH, there is no difference there as well with uh, no IVH. But when you start looking at things like uh, academic skills, uh, grade one, grade two, again, no significant difference. But certainly once you start having grade three and definitely grade four IVH, you start to see some differences in academic skills as measured at the age of eight uh, at school. But what is really interesting is looking at motor dysfunction. And what this shows very clearly is that uh, children with grade two IVH and above, and certainly grade three and grade four, do have significantly impaired motor function compared to children who didn't have IVH or who only had grade one IVH. Um, and this is quite important because a number of studies previously have suggested that children with grade one and grade two IVH, as assessed at the age, age of about two, don't seem to have significant motor impairment. And, and this very well-conducted uh, population-based study seems to show uh, differently. And I think this is an important thing to uh, ensure that parents are aware of. Um, so I'm going to stop there with, with outcomes from IVH. Uh, I think we could talk about outcomes from IVH for quite some time. And, and certainly you could dig into uh, multiple different uh, uh, outcomes, but um, uh, I don't think time will allow us to do that. I'll take any questions that might arise, and then we'll go on to some of the difficulties with, with the prognostic uncertainty. So, uh, Sita, we've got a question from Dr. Jay Sunge uh, from uh, Sri Lanka. So he's asked, if you decide to treat uh, grade three, grade four IVH, say after the IVH is stabilized and you have uh, ventricular dilatation, what is your modality of treatment? Do you consider therapeutic lumbar punctures first or would you wait for the VIs to exceed 95th centile before you actually intervene? And there's a lot of controversy around the worry that you keep having periventricular ischemic infarction with the dilatation and that waiting for that centile might be too late. But just what approach do you have in George's? So I think that's a very good question. And I think there's a, there's a lot of concern about um, the fact that we are waiting too long to intervene. But equally, um, the um, the success of things like lumbar puncture is not always very high. In fact, I think our own experience with lumbar punctures is that uh, they can be quite challenging uh, to get adequate amounts of fluid out. And, and, and a number of children, this is uh, non-communicating. So it's very difficult to get the fluid out through lumbar punctures. And then of course, if you start thinking about other interventions like uh, intraventricular traps, those probably do come with more significant um, uh, sequelae from the intervention itself. So our neurosurgeons at the moment uh, tend not to intervene unless 
uh, you are above the 95th centile and, and significantly so. And we don't just use ventricular index, but we also look at uh, head circumference measurements and the, the rapid rise in head circumference uh, is, uh, is often used uh, alongside the, the ventricular indices to decide on when to intervene. We also look at how the child is doing uh, overall uh, and how stable they are from an intervention perspective as well. In a child who is doing well from a respiratory perspective, who is feeding well, who is neurologically behaving very really well, then and, and, and whose you know, sutures are, are able to separate and, and the head circumference isn't growing particularly and the ventricles look reasonably big but stable and increasing, we, we tend not to intervene. We, the in level of intervention also varies depending on the age of the child. So the younger they are and the, and the, uh, and the earlier uh, post hemorrhage uh, this is happening, the, the greater the likelihood that even a shunt uh, would fail. Um, and so again, the surgeons tend to be a little bit circumspect about intervening um, and would only consider if there's significant evidence of compromise as a result of this. Whether that, that, that affects a long-term outcome, I think is, is, is much more difficult to say. There are, like I said earlier, there are certainly some studies that seem to suggest that uh, developmental outcomes are worse if you wait longer. Uh, but that isn't uh, that hasn't been borne out in every uh, study, and there are some that seem to suggest uh, that it it doesn't matter. The other problem, of course, is that uh, once you put a, a, a VP shunt in, uh, shunt failures tend to be not uncommon in the younger groups. And once you have a shunt, then uh, things like uh, ventriculitis and uh, shunt infection often has a significant impact on long-term outcome as well. Uh, so it's, it, these, these interventions in themselves are not necessarily without significant uh, ability to affect your long-term outcome. So it's, it's, a, it's it, it, again, much like with the NEC and surgery, it's often a, a, a discussion between neurologists, neurosurgeons, and the neonatal team as to when is the right time to intervene. That's really helpful, Sirio. Uh, one last question that we'll take. Uh, so Abhijit has spoken about so interventricular hemorrhage is obviously something that we consider quite carefully in terms of grades, uh, potential outcomes. We do follow-up scanning. Uh, what about cerebellar bleeds? There's some evidence coming up that cerebellar bleeds might be as important. And that's something that we focus much less on. Uh, we've started doing transcerebellar views now through our mastoid views. So just your thoughts. I, I think that's a very, very important uh, question. And I think if you look at the Australian experience as well, that study that I just uh, showed earlier, uh, that was from an era where uh, the scans were predominantly uh, through your, um, 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 uh, your anterior, um, uh, the, 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 the anterior fontanelle and, and, and did not involve scans looking through the mastoid, looking at the cerebellum, et cetera. Um, we still don't uh, do the mastoid views very much, uh, principally because um, the level of expertise in interpreting them is, uh, uh, is not quite there. But we do selectively do it if um, the, uh, the normal sort of scan would suggest that there's some cerebellar involvement. Um, I, I think this is probably an area that we're gonna see a little bit more on in the future. The other thing that, that also from is important is there's, there's probably a degree of under recognition of more punctate white matter injury as opposed to the sort of more, uh, what we call sort of periventricular leukomalacia, but more punctate areas of, of, of injury. And there have been certainly some interesting MRI studies recently that have shown that even where you have lower grades of IVH, but you've had more punctate white matter injury available, uh, visible on MRI scans, that has correlated with uh, some of the poorer, poorer long-term outcomes as well. So I, I think this, this area of, of neuroimaging of these babies will become uh, more of an area that we look at. Um, you know, there are, of course, some significant practical challenges for uh, most neonatal units, even in high-resource countries, if we started to do, do more MRI scanning, for example.